According to the 2011 census, England and Wales have become more ethnically diverse with rising numbers of people identifying with minority ethnic groups. However, this isn't the story in our corridors of power in terms of fairer representation across the board, especially in relation to women from diverse racial minorities. Out of the entire 650 MPs, only 27 are ethnic minority, of which nine are women. Representing the Conservative Party are Helen Grant, the Conservatives' first black female MP, and Priti Patel, the Conservatives' first female Asian MP. Presently serving in the Labour Party are Diane Abbott. She led the way for ethnic female representation when she became the first black woman MP for Hackney North and Stoke Newington in 1987. Roshanara Ali, Shabana Mahmood and Yasmin Qureshi became the first three Muslim female MPs in 2010. Also in the Labour camp are Valerie Vaz, Seema Malhotra and Chi Onwura. The Liberal Democrats at the moment have zero ethnic minority representation. Furthermore, there is no minority representation across the remaining political parties. With such a low number of female MPs in our political system, the question has to be asked, how important is it that we have representation from this section of the community? I caught up with some members of the general public to get their thoughts and opinions on this. How important is it that women are equally represented in Parliament? Women should be equally represented in Parliament because there's almost as many women in the world as there are men. Well, everyone's important, not just women. It's to do everybody. Everybody needs to have a say because everybody's in this together. Not only in politics, but everywhere, women are always seen as the lower gender and we should be equal. It's not representative as such, um, but if that's what people have voted for, I would say that's, that's the result that's, that's happened. I think minorities are incredibly underrepresented, women are incredibly underrepresented. Um, it's, it's way too much of the old boys club in my opinion. The Commons has nine ethnic minority female MPs, but are they known to everyone? Would members of the public be aware of them? Can you name me two ethnic minority female MPs? <laughs> I can name you two ethnic minority uh, female politicians. Um, uh, Diane Abbott and Baroness Varsity, but I couldn't tell you who was an MP. I'm a politics student and I really should be able to do this, but uh, Baroness Varsity for one, and then I couldn't name him second. No. no. Diane Abbott and oh, there's a lady within the Conservative Party, I don't know her name. Baroness Farsi. I can't remember. I can't remember a second. No, I can't. No. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Although it's not a scientific study, out of the 30 people I posed this question to, no one was able to name me two female minority MPs. Questions arise as to why this is and what this is indicative of. People saying Diane and Zaid is indicative actually of um, how closely connected public profile um, and seniority is to uh, recognition. Well, Diane Abbott has been around for, what, 30 years? She was the first black woman to be elected. There'd be something very wrong if people couldn't name Diane Abbott. And uh, Zaid Avasi was in the Cabinet, so she had a lot of exposure as a member of the Cabinet. Of course, a member from the House of Lords, not as a, a member of the House of Commons. People don't always appreciate the difference between the two. Given the democratic deficit we have regarding ethnicity in the Commons, it's quite an achievement for the nine minority women in the political pool to have achieved the position of Member of Parliament. What's the experience of ethnic minority women being few and far between in our political process? I think it's a great privilege actually and to be fair, being a, an ethnic minority of woman hasn't made any difference to how I deal with my work and even how I'm treated. Well, you definitely feel like a minority, uh, being one of the few um, ethnic minority women uh, in Parliament. You stand out from the crowd, um, exactly the same as it is for us as Muslim women. Um, and you carry a lot of the pressures of the wider community on your shoulders, as well as just being decent parliamentary representatives. So that gives you a unique set of responsibilities and also um, you know, opportunity as well, because uh, we are able to draw the, bring in insights uh, from 
uh, our own communities as well as the wider community. In terms of political representation, the situation has improved in terms of diversity, but it's nominal. The number of ethnic minority MPs increased from 15 to 27 at the 2010 general election, 11 for the Tories and 16 for Labour. Research conducted last year by Insight Consulting Group found the three main political parties in the House of Commons are falling woefully short of reflecting the racial mix of their constituents. According to this research, 8.6% of Conservative constituents are minority ethnic. However, the party is 96.3% white. The constituents of Labour MPs are 19.3% ethnic minority and the party 93.7% white and 11.4% of those who live in Lib Dem seats are from ethnic minorities, whereas the party is 100% white. If Parliament was to reflect the minority communities it serves, that's around 14% of the population, what would a fairer and more representative House of Commons look like? If the benches of Parliament were 14% uh, at black and minority ethnic, that would mean there were 91 MPs in Parliament. Uh, in fact, there's only 27, uh, so we have about a third as many as you'd expect given the overall levels of population. Another way to think about it is the 8 million black and minority ethnic people is equivalent to the combined population of Wales and Scotland. Although there's an argument to augment minority representation in the Commons, there is concern from critics that increased numbers of minority MPs would result in those elected serving more the needs of minority communities rather than the wider public. You know, I've heard the, this argument about people from, from uh, minority backgrounds will only serve uh, those from minority backgrounds. It's nonsense, complete nonsense. And, you know, it's a bit like, it's a bit like saying that women will only serve women. The needs of ethnic minorities or the majority communities are identical. Everybody wants good homes, everyone wants decent education, everyone wants a good hospital. Parliament should be a microcosm of the nation and reflect the population it serves and draws upon. However, underrepresentation of certain groups prevails. The progress in escalating representation from ethnic minority communities is painfully slow, given that the minority population of Britain is expected to grow from 14% to 30% by 2050, according to research conducted by the think tank Policy Exchange. These increasing numbers will no doubt influence future election outcomes. I think all the political parties realise that to win a majority they need to get black and minority ethnic voters. Whether or not they're actually doing enough about it uh, to, to sort of match that recognition, uh, I have some serious questions. Um, by 2051 we know the population will be 30% black and minority ethnic, but if they try to react in 2041 or 2051, it'll be too late. They need to be engaging the younger black and minority ethnic population now. We need to understand our own power. We think we're powerless, we're powerful. In 168 marginal seats, the black and minority ethnic communities hold the balance of power. We need to use it. I think across the country, the, the BME vote is absolutely critical to the general election when it's and we, if we look at the polls currently they're very close so actually whoever can capture that that BMA vote, BMA vote can really actually make a difference. I think it's a bit hard to predict exactly how uh, black and Asian and obviously uh, black and Asian female uh, voters will participate but I think there's no doubt that they'll be demanding for much more radical change. So I think the political parties probably haven't yet woken up to the possibilities uh, that ethnic minority communities offer them as voters. I think you can see it quite clearly in the US now that both parties are really um, awake to the idea that ethnic minorities will decide the election. British parties are almost certain to follow. Tell me about your plans to improve the minority representation within your party. We have a future candidates programme in which a large proportion of the people who came forward were from ethnic minorities. But I want to encourage as many people as possible from ethnic minorities to be Labour members of Parliament and we're going to keep pushing forward with that. We're acutely aware in the Lib Dems that our ethnic minority top candidates number, although that's increased, we haven't got an ethnic minority MP in Parliament at the moment. And that's absolutely got to change. It's one of the reasons why I think we need to take some really dramatic action to try and sort it out. 
One of the ways that we've tackled the deficit over this parliament has been through really making sure that women and ethnic minority candidates in the leadership program go for the top seats. And I'm really pleased to see, you know, looking forward to this election, which we're about to fight, about 15% of our candidates are BME and a third of those are women. Despite an increase of 15 minority ethnic MPs between 2001 and 2010 general elections, the diversity of MPs remains disproportionate to the population as a whole. Considering all women shortlists are being implemented, albeit by the Labour Party only, this begs the question, is there an argument for using all black shortlists or all ethnic minority shortlists as they are also sometimes known? My own selection experience taught me that the capacity for division in communities is very, very large um, and, and I think will cause many more problems than the one that it will solve and that's the only reason why I wouldn't back it. What is an ethnic minority? Should we have a shortlist as well for disabled people? You know, they're an important population uh, as well. You can introduce positive discrimination provided it's proportionate. Uh, and uh, otherwise it ends up being challenged in the European courts and it, it's likely that it wouldn't get uh, through. My natural instinct as a Conservative would be to go and seek uh, to encourage talented people to come forward. I would be nervous of that sort of uh, approach if others haven't been really tried and, and proven to, to fail. I'm very proud that we are selecting candidates both in Bradford and Edmonton from an all-female, all-ethnic minority shortlist. That was a decision made by our National Executive Committee. It's probably an idea that needs to be explored in a lot more detail. One of the advantages of having an open discussion about it is it might also encourage people to look at a whole menu of options and practical things that the parties could do to quickly increase the number of people from minority ethnic backgrounds. Sex and Power 2014, Who Runs Britain, a report written by the Centre for Women and Democracy on behalf of the Counting Women in Coalition, paints a pretty gloomy picture of women's access to political, social and economic decision making. A baby girl born today will be drawing her pension before she sees equal representation in her parliament. It's too long to wait. Being a woman and one from a minority community, entering into the political process like many other spheres can be problematic with preconceived ideas and notions of femininity and race. In addition to obstacles around gender and ethnicity, there can also be impediments around age, sexuality and disability to mention a few. Women face numerous obstacles in achieving representation in governance, ethnic minority women more so. I think there's some really significant barriers for ethnic minority women uh, when it comes to political participation. I think both political parties and some parts of the community aren't used to the idea of black and Asian women being leaders. I think sometimes um, when you're talking about uh, encouraging women in, uh, from ethnic minorities into politics, where they've not been used to playing a prominent role before. There's plenty of talent there, no question. Sometimes, though, I think sometimes you need to approach the men and uh, convince them of the value and the virtue of having women role models from their community. And the same goes for disability as well. And one of my roles as new president of the Lib Dems is actually to be a very visible disabled person. You've got commitment, domestic commitments or whatever, then it's going to be hard to take that time out. And the money aspect comes in too because when you go for selection processes, they may be many miles away from where you are. But even if they're near you, the cost of petrol, the bus, the taxi fare, train stay, to get to the meetings, then you could produce all these leaflets and letters and phone calls and whatever. So it can be a very costly experience going to a selection process as well. It's feasible that um, different sort of socioeconomic classes, but also um, religious backgrounds, would affect women in different ways. Again, in these cases, I think it's about the ways in which women are told to be and told what to expect about what they could achieve in life, basically. With a majority of 503 male MPs, does the patriarchal nature of Westminster put women into a compromising position? Everyone who doesn't fit into the 
middle class, professional, white, male norm of Westminster has to fit in because that's the majority and that's how humans behave. Women are a little bit less confident about owning that agenda, uh, owning their own identity and putting it out there, but they shouldn't be because the men aren't, they're not diffident about it and we shouldn't be either. Sexism and racism are prevalent within society, so it's not entirely shocking that discrimination may exist in Westminster. In recent times, some MPs have been dismissed, had to step down or apologise for distasteful and unacceptable comments. Perhaps people from uh, particular backgrounds, particular parts of the country, sometimes people are fearful of expressing themselves awkwardly. There has been huge amounts of discrimination against women and ethnic minorities uh, and there remains huge amounts of indirect discrimination and you still hear stories about direct discrimination. Well, the problem with, with sexist comments and things like that is people think there's nothing very much wrong with them and it's only when you start actually people understanding there is a lot wrong with those comments that you then get the cultural change that you need. I think it's just changing what people think is acceptable and that's a much slower process. It is happening but it's got a way to go. We need to stamp out any sort of sexism, any inappropriate behaviour that takes place in this estate because you know, this is the mother of all parliaments, we should be performing better than any other organisation in this country. The Chamber, a battleground of heated exchanges between the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, amidst a rowdy crowd of MPs, has often been described as testosterone fueled. It doesn't give a good impression to the public and to young people about what we do and how we, how we behave. But I do agree that it is quite, um, it is quite a cut and thrust environment, but not all of the time. The problem with Prime Minister's questions as it is at the moment is that voters actually recognise it and they quite like it, generally. So it's the thing that most people know about Parliament. So if you were going to try and change it, change the rules, for example, to try and help uh, women be heard at Prime Minister's Questions, you'd have to weigh that up against the fact that um, it might be changing the one thing that people tended to recognise about politics. Whilst many women MPs find their behaviour in the chamber unpalatable, others like former Tory MPs Edwina Curry and Anne Widdicombe have said publicly that the new crop of female MPs need to toughen up. The latter has said, if women are struggling, they shouldn't be there. If you can't cope with the place, don't be there. Stop thinking of yourself as a woman MP. I never did. I completely disagree with them. Um, because women are tough. Women can fight with the best of them, but we choose not to operate in that environment um, because we just think actually the way you get things done in life is not about shouting and screaming abuse. Yes, be passionate, absolutely be passionate about what you believe in, but not be abusive with it. And that's the difference. The media is not often seen as an ally of the female MP. Reports in the past have scrutinised women's appearance and their private conduct as opposed to their views, ideas and policies. The 101 Labour women elected in the party's 1997 victory were referred to by certain sections of the press as Blair's babes. The Conservatives' 2010 win saw a fresh intake of women who were described as Cameron's cuties. The press has also come to have a fascination with Home Secretary Theresa May's fashionable footwear. The media matters and um, we've seen a terrible example at the last general election where it felt that women were airbrushed out of the debates um, and the conversations that were going on and there was a real um, focus on women's shoes rather than their views. So this time round at the election we want to see the public putting pressure on the broadcasters and we want to see the government and all the parties taking note of that and that making sure that when it comes to the public making their decisions about who they want to be in power that they're seeing women in equal measure to men on the television screens hearing them on the radio so we think that public pressure is really important and, and media matters because if you're not seeing uh, women being represented and hearing those voices that again is going to make a lot of women feel that politics isn't something for them. Socioeconomic status not only impacts on opportunities available and success of individuals, but research also shows potentially impacts on levels of political participation behaviours. Critics argue that political influence is polarising according to class and wealth. 
after the 2010 general election, an analysis by the Sutton Trust showed over one-third, or 35% of MPs elected for the 2010 parliament, attended fee-paying schools, which educate just 7% of the school population. The proportion of MPs attending independent schools from the previous parliament was 32%. The study also showed that of the 2010 Parliament, 54% of Conservative MPs attended fee-paying schools, compared with 40% of Liberal Democrat MPs and 15% of Labour MPs. I think there's a real problem with symbolic representation of having lots of wealthy people from privately educated backgrounds and often who went to Oxford or Cambridge in Parliament because it does just say to people this is the kind of person who becomes a politician and if you don't look like them and you don't have their background then you're obviously just going to think well that's probably not for me then um, and that would probably be a fair conclusion on the evidence that's currently put forward every single day at Westminster. Increasingly Parliament is a place for white middle-class uh, educated people who come from Oxbridge who go through the think tank route, go through Westminster bubble route and I think it's a real challenge uh, both in terms of getting New, new people coming through political parties and coming through that process, but also in terms of voters looking at those politicians and thinking, are those people like me? Can I relate to those people? Do they understand my concerns? I think we've also got to be a little bit careful about the charge of elitism. You always get the thing about everyone went to Oxbridge. Well, I went to Oxford, but I also went to a comprehensive school in Bradford. I was the first member of my family ever to go to university. So I'm not ashamed of the fact that I went to Oxford. And I don't think it marks me out as a member of an elite. It just says that I was reasonably able at school and my teachers and my family encouraged me to apply to a great university. And it gave me you know, a fantastic start in life. Um, so I would also caution that um, I wouldn't want to sort of put people off trying to go to a great university if that's where their talents and aspirations take them. Um, but, you know, equally, I think it's important we have that, you know, lots of people, lots of different backgrounds schooling wise. With every five year term of parliament, there naturally comes a retirement rate. So the number of MPs, both women and men, reduces. Thus far, research from University College London has tracked 86 MPs who will be standing down in 2015, but this number may well increase the closer we get to the election. Only a minimal amount of seats tends to change hand in an election. These are marginal seats where a more balanced mix of viewpoints exists amongst the voters. In some of these seats, it only takes a very small edge, sometimes a matter of a few dozen votes for the seat to change hands. The decision-making in how marginal seats and, more importantly, retirement seats where MPs are standing down are filled are key in expanding the pool of women and ethnic minorities in politics. I think there's recognition across the parties that candidate selection processes need to be shaken up um, and obviously it's up to parties to determine how to do that but I don't think it's good enough for them just to continue as is and then to be surprised when their figures don't improve. The local members in that area will still be making the democratic choice about who will be their candidate put forward for the general election. It's fair, it's democratic, and we're helping to reduce the soft barriers. I think one of the issues is there's only one MP or one candidate selected in each seat. And so it's quite easy to say, oh, it just happened to be a man. And then it's a bit odd that it just happened to be a man in 78% of cases. We are such a small party. Um, to get a, a new MP elected takes a huge amount of effort because you've got to rest that seat off uh, the other, uh, one of the other parties. And that's the difficulty for us. I think the thing that stands in the way of the Liberal Democrats trying to increase the numbers of women and I think minorities in their party is actually just political will as opposed to being a small party or a large party or whatever. But if you look at the seats that we're most likely to win, so those where there's an incumbent MP who's retiring, you know, again, those numbers are replicated. It's around a third of all those seats are um, now going to be fought by women and just about, just over 15% by BME candidates. What really matters, I think, is the opening up of the parties at the very beginning of the process. If you just look at the point where you've got candidates being selected, that's probably a bit late. You need to be looking at to who is coming into your party. Are the existing members really kind of reaching a hand out to people from different walks of life and bringing them along with them?